blast off we got a lot to talk about today okay absolute gem from hindu nationalist twitter i saw the one that with adolf hitler but it's like pro adolf hitler and pro benjamin netanyahu yeah indian twitter is so awesome like specifically hindu nationalist twitter is so awesome this is an indian pro israel blue check comparing netanyahu to hitler because he likes them both i mean i i like that is a more morally consistent position it's just like it's funny but at least like it's technically not inconsistent like they're both fascists that have done genocides one is uh, currently conducting one so like like it's not wrong it's just very funny to be in support of it it's moral consistency it's moral consistency but it's like weird that you're in support of both of these things uh you are a real freak like while i admire the intellectual and moral honesty here i i i cannot comprehend how imaginably brain broken you must be to like both of these guys at the same time anyway so without further ado let's blast off we got a lot going on today um um did you hear the terribly misogynistic guy who did the game his game tiktoks died yeah i saw rest in peace to a comrade to a fallen comrade um anyway let's um uh, let's blast off let's get into it there's a lot to talk about 17 days out from the election i think it's 17 days am i wrong is this 17 days i hope i'm right fuck it i don't even care we'll watch hog watch talking yahya sinwar assassinated by israel what does this what next um drama 17 hours out from the election Ho poll watch hog watch yeah here's some in a bit israel what next um a stead on the broadcast follow up on last kamala talk and more get in now chatter that made the anti-semit uh anti-semitism uh like blast off meme actually i would use normally but i don't want to use that while i'm straight up uh you know tagging instead on the on the tweet so i like normally i would use it but i can't use it now so do you guys have that you guys have a different one okay that's a good one okay uh, it wasn't yeah you know what you're right i shouldn't say assassinated killed in combat by israel i updated it you're right assassination is not the correct term there um bro you might as well stream on the steam deck at this point wait why what did i do there's trump burgers what the fuck is that today we're reviewing trump burger yes guys donald j trump has a burger restaurant and i am not biased i do not take sides however he has burgers so we're here for the burgers so whether it tastes good or bad that's up to the restaurant but in any case i was going to austin texas and i saw this place and i had to stop in look inside guys this is insane i've never seen a restaurant that looks like this they also have a biden burger for 51 dollars like inflation one ounce of beef topped with old tomato and oldest buns available due to do unavailable due cheating and inflation wait they okay i guess i'm not the only one with the typos in his fucking merchandise what do you mean due cheating and inflation hey shit it says like old buns old tomatoes what the heck starting off for 13 bucks we got that trump burger printed on okay the that looks like shit dog where is it where is this where did he say this was kentucky how are you going to be in the fucking, how are you going to be in Kentucky and have dog shit burgers? Like, what do you have at that point? Austin, Texas? Ain't no way. That's even worse. Bro, I'm going to be, I'm going to keep it a, a buck 50 with you. If you are in Texas and you make a dog shit burger, you have nothing else to live for. Okay. It's like, that's the one thing. That's your thing. You should be able to make solid fucking burgers, dog. What are you doing? This looks like dried out cafeteria food, bro. What the hell is this? This shit makes the beast burger look edible, dog. How? How? On the aesthetic front alone, this better taste incredible, okay? Because I am already pissed off. I'm already fucking pissed off, dude. What, what remains if you do not have burgers? America is the burger nation. If you fuck up the burger might as well not be around at that point okay you might as well let western civilization crumble because god damn it this is what it's for god damn that is 
that just pissed me off early on dude we just we just we just started okay we just started and i'm already pissed off dude what the fuck blends with fries and look at this thing that this thing ain't as tall as a trump tower my goodness oh glaze come on bro this dude okay no more integrity from this guy okay i question i question the intellectual integrity of luke foods this seems a little biased okay and i saw this white boy pop off when he first encountered when he first encountered the delightful delectable delectable world of indian food okay this white boy was swagged out he was losing his dang mind okay the first time he dipped that fucking naan, I think it was in butter chicken or whatever. One of those is tikka masala. I was like, I've, I've been there. You know, I remember my first time like that was passionate. Okay. That was passionate shit. What the hell is this? It's terrible. <laughs> Never Nothing mind. I is. spoke too soon. I, oh, he we're back. We're back. We're back. Luke is back. Listen, my bad. I should have never. I should have never come for the king. I should have never come for the goat. I should have let my goat speak. I saw him talk about the Trump Tower thing, and I was like, damn, he's glazing, okay? I should have never, ever come for my goat like that. Luke, I apologize. Mea culpa, okay? My B, okay? My fucking B, dude. This is like, at the Hassan Ever broadcast, you know, you got some moments, right? You got like, oh. Putin would never invade Ukraine. You know, you got that. And now this, okay? Probably worse than the Putin take. This is your my bad asthma moment? Yeah. Not as, yeah, my, this is my my bad moment. My bad moment. Sometimes I'm popping off a little too hard, okay? I'm trying to make some content here. You turn into a snake dog? Yeah, for sure. Trump, but this burger sucks, okay? This Maybe he'll flip again by the end of this video. This dude has the independent voter face. <laughs> That's a great description. This burger is absolutely horrible. It tastes strange, really funky, fake as heck. Like it's a pretty big burger, but it just, yeah. Try their fries. Those are all right, but they just don't have like any salt on them. Finally, we got the first lady chicken sandwich for also 13 bucks. And look at this chicken. It looks kind of square for some reason. No, no. But that's not the most unseasoned chicken I've ever had in my life. I mean, it's yeah, so what much. were you expecting? Honestly, it's fucking it's the trump establishment dude you know that's hey uh, they are yeah they're that's not that's not surprising to me i'm gonna be honest and it is dry like i said i have nothing against trump okay but this is this food needs to be better okay 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 this white boy once again extremely swagged out right why because he's had the delightful the delights that this world has to offer in terms of indian food my man, his life has changed so dramatically. His life has changed. Indian. What? Audio is off? What do you mean? Is this cam delayed? What? Desktop audio is behind? Well, hell no. Prices aren't terrible, but overall, taste wise, I'm going like a three out of 10. Donald, please make your restaurant great again. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is? Oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. It's happening again. This happened like. I can't unsee it now. They're trolling. Do you remember the solution from last time? Fuck, I don't remember. What the fuck did I do last time? I don't remember, dude. Fuck. Audio was about one to two seconds off. Oh, this used to happen back in the day, too. Is the audio from the video is definitely delayed? Ay, ay, ay. Hold on, hold on. Let's do a YouTube video and we'll fucking find it. Delay cam and mic by one sec. No, that's not it. That's not it. It's like hardware acceleration or some shit. I think that's what it was. It's not me. My audio and my video are not delayed. But when I watch videos, it like there is a little bit of an audio delay. Let me see. The prices aren't terrible, but overall taste wise, I'm going like a three out of ten. Donald, please make your restaurant great again. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, my see my audio is not delayed on my on my mouth. What did we do? What did we do last time? Set the desktop audio to 50 milliseconds delay. No, dude, we didn't do that. Shut up. That's not what we did. I checked off uh, on properties on my desktop audio. I checked off use device timestamps. There it is. Let's go. Let's freaking go. Wait, I do. I checked use device timestamps. Should I not have it on? I checked off uh, on properties on my desktop audio. 
I checked off use device timestamps. I checked them off. It was on. I checked them off. Okay. It's no longer on. Let's see how this works. Is it fixed? We don't know. Pass this on. The vid is unsync. I just watched it. Okay. Let's try it again. Might need to restart. No. Try it again with the Indian Today food. Today we're trying vid. Indian food. We got the buttered chicken, the garlic naan, the onion bajia, the gulab jamun. I think I got that right. And the gulab jamun. Yeah, the, a fix, right? Let's fucking go, baby. Let's go. Let's go, dude. Oh, this is light work, baby. Light work. Not even a problem, dude. Send me some real fucking issues so I can deal with that shit. You know what I mean? Okay, I'm just kidding. Spectrum, please don't fuck me up. Uh, please stop making that noise. I thought the police were outside of my house again. What do you mean again, bro? What the hell do you mean by again? Um. Anyway, we blasted off, but I don't think people saw it. Go fucking interact with this shit, bro. What are, what are we doing? Go interact with this. Go like it. Go retweet it. Okay. Hi, chat and rest easy. Five, uh, five, one, five D 53. Oh, that was the other. Yeah. That was the color scheme that I used to use and I no longer use that. Um, anyway, switch to blue sky. I'm not doing that. Okay. 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 Let's get started. Let's get ready to rumble. We got a lot to talk about. Okay. You already know. You already know. We got a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on in the world. Okay. There is a lot happening. Did you show Chad the body hit video? Oh yeah, I, me and Austin sat the fuck down. We sat our white asses down and we watched body head and it was awesome. It was incredible. I'm a hardcore Republican. You are my favorite streamer. I hope this is okay with you, question mark. I love your commentary. Hell yeah, brother. I'm a goddamn hardcore Republican myself, okay? An Irish Republican. Did you see Emma Vigelin and her team defending you yesterday on the majority report? Yes, I did. Uh, I did see that. Shouts out. I also reached out to Uncle Sam and I was like, bro, can you please talk to Ethan? Um, I'm like legit worried on his uh, trajectory and he said he would do it. So I might, uh, I might set that up. <sighs> you got to cut the Greeks lander. No, the Greeks are the goats. I love, I love them. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna lie. It looks like you're drinking poison from the 1800s. I am. I am drinking poison called cold brew. All right. So. Sam needs to talk to him offline. Yes. Uh, no, no, that's the, that's the point. I don't, I don't care if it's like content or not. I, I just, I, I want that to happen offline. Yes. I, I want that to happen online, offline. Doesn't matter for me. Donat or Gulab Jamun gun to your head. Donat. Very, very few foods that I would substitute Donat for. Maybe some other Turkish food, but maybe Monta. Um, what the fuck is cold brew is beer. Yeah. I'm getting hammered. Every goddamn morning when I start my, my broadcast, I'm getting freaking hammered. I'm getting sauced up. Does Tamasius have a playlist for today? That's the question. Or did he not make a playlist for today? I'm sure he has one. Uh, we got CIA Johnny back <laughs> at it. We'll talk about the strongest militia in the Middle East. He's talking about Hezbollah. Uh, we'll watch it, of course. Oh, here it is. He linked it twice. All right. So... Uh, we will, I think, let me, let me hit up, uh, instead, make sure that he's still good to go for later. Wait, one. Oh, wait, holy shit. He did. Wait, I'm going to start the uh, conversation with instead actually today. Okay. I forgot that I had him on for 1 PM and then I was wrong. I didn't end up doing that. Hold on. I got to fix my, um, I got to fix my audio video. Okay. Input device. Do, 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 do. Voice settings, Rodecaster Pro, microphone. Okay. <coughs> check, 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 check. Okay. That's working. Output device. That's good. Okay. La, 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 la. Video settings. Uh, OBS virtual camera. Start the virtual cam. Test that video. That's also working. Great. Okay. I can do it. All right. Today, we're going to start the conversation with instead. Okay. And while Tadek is here as well, he just uh, walked in. That's crazy. Okay. But I'm going to call Estead right now. Hello. I am calling. Hi, right, stop growling. I might need to open the... All right. Let's see if he turns on. Let's see if I... I hope I didn't mute. Calling now. Okay. I got I to gotta open my door real quick because Tadek's here. All right. Let's see. Tadek. What's good, King? 
Uh, I'm doing an interview and stuff, so I can't. Yeah. Oh, hello. You guys can you guys can come say what's up to Kaya if you want. I'm uh, I'm about to conduct an interview. Um, if I can actually make it work. I don't know. I can't hear him or see him. But yeah, in the other monitors in the other room. What's up? God damn, bro. You came in with the whole squad. Yeah, that's how bad the monitor is, huh? That's how bad Myung's monitors are. That's crazy. Um, I can't hear you. Uh, let's see. Let's call him again. Let's do a voice call this time. Maybe it'll work. Show Tariq? No. Um, he is, uh, Tariq is right now uh, picking up his monitor that he bought and placed in my house uh, last time he was here. But because uh, he no longer is my input settings on Discord. No, no, no. I already fixed my input output. I just, he's not picking up. I'm calling him, but he's not picking up. But that's because I'm late. Oh, I, okay. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? It's dead. What's up? How are you? What's going on? Can you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I'm in a yes. parking suburban North Carolina. Hell yeah. Okay. I'm going to pop out right here. I might actually have to uh, change my uh, my virtual camera settings real quick. Program default. Scene source 4K cam. Okay, that should be better. All right. Um, okay, doing a couple tweaks. My uh, computer fried yesterday while I was talking to, uh, while I was talking to Dave Weigel. Oh, from no. Semaphore. And... And uh, that is the reason why I've been, you know, I, I, I had to reboot everything in its entirety. And that's what I'm working uh, Dave's on. Dave's a good currently. dude. His piece about Democrats moving right was really good. Yeah. Well, that's actually uh, interesting enough. That's probably what we will be talking about quite a bit today, I suspect. Let me do yeah. a video. Let me do a window capture here. And let's see. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Boom. Okay. I got you right here. Okay. Uh, here we are. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, coming on. Um, that's what I actually wanted to talk to you about. You're, what are you doing right now? You're, you're in uh, North Carolina? Yeah, I'm in North Carolina for um, an episode of The Run Up, uh, our podcast. We are following a bunch of the storm recovery efforts and seeing how it affected early voting. And so today we are with Democrats and the North Carolina governor. Uh, tomorrow we're out in the storm affected areas in the western part with the Republicans, because there's actually a lot of Republican areas who have been most uh, severely damaged. Yeah, because so the, we're seeing how it impacts. Yeah, because uh, of the because of the lasers, here. right? Because of the weather yeah, machine. Yeah, because of the because of the scientifically controlled storms. I mean, that's part of what we're talking about here too. Like, there's been so much misinformation and disinformation on that front too. It's been a huge story. Yeah, um, it's it's really interesting to think about uh, how how we have arrived at the idea that climate change is man made, but like <laughs> in the worst possible way uh, for for the at least thirty percent of the American population that was like, nah, climate change is made up, is a Chinese conspiracy, and that now they're like, oh, anthropogenic climate change is real. It's just that you know <laughs> it's the weather machine that's doing it. It is like one of the, I do think that we've always talked about climate impacts as like theoretical and coming in the future. And this has totally been, a, you know, Florida, North Carolina have been totally upended, Georgia, parts of it too. So a bunch of the organizing efforts we're hearing now from Democrat and Republican are about making sure people are still all right. Even though Republicans, as to your point, are like not acknowledging the source or obviously have made climate a big part of any policy. Yeah, I, I do find it interesting because like, it's I think the the um, lack like the refusal overall to to acknowledge climate change, I think, has caused uh, a lot of these uh, localities to not harden their infrastructure adequately as well. That partnered up with like austerity, like permanent austerity from especially the Republican side, I think, has created this very unique circumstance where like they almost refuse to even do like the bare minimum that they have to to protect their own citizens. Um, I think that's fair. And I think like, I mean, we're in North Carolina, the only no south Southern state that has a Democratic governor. And one of the things he said was like, for a lot of those states, they're the ones experiencing the obviously frontline impacts of climate change. But most of them are run by a Republican Party or Republican governors who are not even interested in the federal money on that front. And so, like, it's taken this massive disaster for even Republicans to, 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 like, even acknowledge in the slightest 
um, even some of the funds that were available to them to do something up. And so, like, it, it has taken the kind of lowest common denominator to, for there to be any type of shift, particularly in the South. Yeah. So, so last time you and I had a conversation on this broadcast, uh, we talked about Kamala Harris's chances or uh, yeah. what it would look like. I think it was before Kamala Harris became the candidate, or was it right after? It was right after, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And um, some of the things that I was like very worried about on the messaging front was that, uh, you know, I, I was fearful that the Democrats might pull the old tricks uh, that the Democrats always engage with, which is to like moderate their views and try to like hammer on this like moderate Republican framing on a yep. lot of issues, adopt Republican framing on a lot of issues, which I thought uh, would potentially be a dangerous gamble in the in the electoral calculus for the likes of uh, Kamala Harris. And I was wondering, since you've been... All right, bye. Bye, guys. Uh, sorry, I just have my buddy who's picking up his monitor. Um, but the question, I, the question I have for you is, uh, since that conversation, do you feel like the Democrats have... I mean, I, I do genuinely think the Democrats have changed their messaging and or rather uh, moved to the middle as best as possible, sometimes directly to the right. And uh, do you feel like that has been successful? Well, I think it's definitely the strategy. I think you correctly identified what ended up being true. Like, the time in which we were talking, there was that kind of burst of energy. There was the party reuniting around her. And I think there was an open opportunity of interest for people to say, okay, let me take another look at this person who I may not know a lot about. As they've started to add meat to the bones on that front, they've almost exclusively done that from a Republican or more centrist uh, lens whether that is basically conceding Donald Trump's crisis or a described crisis on immigration, whether that is a policy front where she's talked about a bipartisan council of advisors or the need to have a Republican in the cabinet, whether that's campaigning with Liz and Dick Cheney. It's basically been the only place she's been willing to show any type of break from Biden yeah. on is uh, saying, I'm Biden, except more open to kind of Republican and centrist ideas. We had Mark Cuban on our podcast. And one of the things he's saying, he was like, I did not like Biden because I felt that he was anti-business and anti-billionaire in some sense. <laughs> and he has felt, oh, yeah, this is just me were saying what he said. Yeah. And he said that one of the biggest differences he's seen is that Harris calls him up and that Harris has tried to have an openness on that front. And so when I asked Cuban, I was like, well, isn't she trying to be everything that everyone shouldn't, you know, I talked to Bernie Sanders who said that she could be open to progressives. He's like, I think progressives are kidding themselves. And this is a centrist president who's making that clear. And I kind of think he's right. Like, I kind of think that Harris has now positioned herself, not just as someone who is more quote unquote moderate, but is preparing for, I think, maybe a Republican Senate or divided Washington. And I do think the Democrats have basically tried to course correct from 2019, where they think they were too progressive. And they've done this in the last month or so. And so it's come off, I think, as if she is rejecting the last primary and the position she used to have. But I really think it's a kind of party apparatus that's trying to recalibrate itself and is frankly conceding that that has to come from the center, at least in their view. Now, if that's successful, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I agree with that analysis, but I agree that's their thinking. Yeah. So there's two different questions I have, I guess. I'm of two different minds here. On the one hand, uh, I like to say I, I put my, you know, Harris Waltz uh, analyst hat on, right? And, and think about it as like, is this an effective way to run a campaign um, yeah. for the uh, general election? Like, will this be a winning strategy? And then I also have this uh, pesky little, like my own personal opinion on the matter, and um, and then I think even if it is successful in terms of winning the election, what does that say about the future of not only the Democratic Party, but just like the future of American governance in general? And yeah. I don't think that uh, it is as profoundly and, and as overtly successful in the way that like the Democratic uh, analysts think. And I wanted to show you this blueprint uh, 2024 public uh, opinion research that came out on messaging and the preference effects it has. And I wanted to hear your perspective on that. 
Uh, hold on. I'm going to share my screen with you real quick. Let's see yep. if that works. Last time I did this, my computer basically broke, but hopefully it'll, because I was do, showing this to Dave Weigel and my computer basically broke. And I also just spilled some coffee in front of me. I'm, uh, I'm all over the place. So um, have you seen this already? I don't think so. So yeah, it, it shows the hypothetical answers. What if anything would have done differently than President Biden over the past four years? And it shows the preference effect overall and the preference effect from independence. And some of her most progressive policies that I've definitely been on board with that I definitely appreciate, such as at home, hold on, let me do this real quick. Okay, such as at home medical care, at home Medicare, the expansion of Medicare to also cover home assistance uh, to cover at home health care. Plus 10 for Harris, uh, preference effect for independence, also plus 10 for Harris. Framing it as like greedy corporations. I'm not happy with what greedy corporate giants got away with over the past year, uh, last few years uh, since the pandemic. Price gouging, which has yeah. been an incredibly resilient policy point from the Harris camp, regardless of the attacks, including but not limited to even the New York Times, like doing the classic, like we brought forward our economists and they thought, this is not even possible to do. This is, yeah. you know, regardless of that, it seems like the American public is very receptive to this idea. Uh, although it is a profoundly, dare I say, radical policy, if, if we're being real. I mean, this is, I think it's very effectively messaged because you're not saying we're going to institute price caps, but I, I, it's been very popular. Whereas uh, in terms of the actual answers, like the, the further down you go, the more she talks about like small businesses or the opportunity economy yeah. or what is my only difference from Joe Biden? Oh, I'll have a Republican in my cabinet. The preference effect is underwater minus 21 yeah. when she says not an actual thing. I mean, I think that tracks with some of my reporting and experience. And I mostly think that because the desire for change and the dissatisfac dissatisfaction with the status quo has always been more evident in the electorate than I've seen the Democratic Party acknowledge in this cycle. You know, for the first two years, they were holding on to Biden. And I don't think that was just a problem because of his age. I think that was also a problem because it kind of tied them in to a status quo that for a lot of people, they're not really working from the premise of that being what they want. And so like, and then, so I think that they were just late to arriving, that even in just switching candidates, there was another barrier that she had to clear is, what is the difference between you and the previous candidate? And they just arrived to kind of articulating any of those differences. But let me explain to you what I think is, or what my kind of reporting tells me is the, the campaign's thinking on this front. Like, it's not just that uh, centrist policies have often been where the Democratic Party reflexively goes in the general. It is their lessons from the last midterm election and the presidential election before that. They basically have gotten away from the idea that they can change the electorate by bringing in a whole bunch of new people and bringing in some progressives or young people or, or the like. And they've pretty much embraced the idea that they should win over those people who are most consistently going to vote. And as much as the electorate looks like that, that's better for Harris because that's the kind of anti-Trump coalition. And so I think it's an effort for them not to really just target the folks they know are most likely gonna show up to the polls and try to get the gang back together that caused them to do better than expected in the midterms. It's a very like battleground specific strategy, but I also think it's a strategy that kind of concedes the issues to Trump yeah. and concedes him as the main character of the race. And so why we could have had a race that was kind of two competing visions or two directions of the country. I don't really, I think it's directions. I think there's a competence difference. I'm not saying they're the same. I guess I'm saying they are not playing. They're not, they're not, they're not starting from a different premise. And yeah. partially that's because they don't really think they need to, to win. They think the type of people who come out, and they know are going to come out, they're real. They're willing to take a Trump referendum because they think basically 55, 45 chance anti-Trump beats Trump. 
Yeah. I just think that's a little risky. <laughs> and so, like, the risk of that has been something I, I have just been shocked about their unwillingness to price in. But that's the thinking when you see the kind of messaging shifts that yeah. you're, I think, right in identifying over the last couple months. Especially risky for Kamala Harris. Because when I look at the polls that say, regardless of her, like, very clear communication, especially since the swap out, that she is going to be a, uh, you know, a conservative. She's, she wants a muscular military, a lethal military, right? Like all yeah. this stuff, um, you know, how she owns a Glock and, uh, you know, she's not afraid to use it if you come to her house yeah. and, and that, uh, you know, she's going to follow the law on all this stuff. <laughs> You're all right there instead? Yeah, my, my uh, phone keeps falling from my makeshift stand. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. Uh, so... Um, regardless of all of that stuff, Americans still view Kamala Harris by 46% as too liberal. And I think yeah. you and I both know what the real reason for that is, right? It's not her messaging. It's not her communication. And it's not because the, the broader electorate is like much more conservative, or I guess they are a little conservative in their broad reception uh, of Kamala Harris, but it's not actually about policies. It's because she's a black woman. I think that is the real reason why they view her as liberal, too liberal, I, quote unquote. Yeah, I think that is 90% of the reason. I think that I, and even in my own experience, like you'll go places and the assumptions that black folks are inherently this like progressive, even though he doesn't even fit with sometimes the facts of black electorate and communities. The only thing I would add to that though, is I think it's also tied for me to how she introduced herself to the country in 2019. She, yeah. uh, she, and I think this is the still the, the, the kind of core problem with people's understanding of her ideology. She was half a progressive messenger back then. And so I think because pri the last primary, there was such an incentive for everybody who wasn't Joe Biden to basically flirt with this kind of progressive aesthetic. Yeah. I think it fueled the idea that she was a San Francisco liberal. Yeah. And if she would have come out in that race and been, I think, the moderate she mostly is um i think we kind of we could have had a different reality but i think the, the 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 assumptions based on identity plus what we saw in 2019 adds up to something where i think the i think the campaign has a challenge of authenticity that they have to clear like you have to tell like, policy is mostly a proxy for people you know m most people understand who i talk to at least that when politicians promise something on the trail, it, the, it, it, it won't often happen because of the realities of governance and Congress and stuff. Yeah. You're mostly signaling to people who you are, what you believe in, and what the story you're telling your, of yourself and your beliefs are. And I just think her story has been inconsistent. And so I thought they would come into this race after the candidate switch and understand that and kind of more frontally own the pivot. Say, hey, 2019 was a little crazy. Maybe Democrats did that. Maybe Democratic Party was someplace I wasn't. I've been in the White House for four years and I've learned how govern governing works. Now I'm this person, whatever, sure. But they've kind of tried to do that without saying it most explicitly. And I think that's helping fuel some of the, um, uh, some of the kind of thirst for more answers and tougher questions and things like that is because I don't think you can say a new way. I think when you say a new way forward and you ha and you were the vice president and also you haven't had a primary to explain any differences from you and the rest of your party. Yeah. I think it's fair for people to say, what does that mean? Yeah. You know? And I think that's a question they haven't really answered. And the only, the biggest thing I would say is if you don't answer that, then you're kind of a status quo candidate. You know, you're kind of representing now in a time when people want change. And so you can bring change through identity or representation or the like, but at some point, I think the best version of a Democratic candidate is one that actually lays a vision forward. And I still think we're asking, what is the Kamala Harris vision? Yeah, and with 17 days out from the election, I think it's like, it, I think that that is a, a uh, I mean, it's a difficult endeavor. It's definitely very difficult to have this truncated campaign and and launch it with like a couple months out from the actual deadline uh having said that i do think that the policy prescriptions that they had some good and some i think falling significantly short of what is necessary 
have have caused this issue for people um especially when you're conceding to right-wing framing on a lot of these issues yeah. now the reason why i brought up the fact that people perceive her as too liberal san francisco black woman regardless yeah. of the fact that she's literally uh you know a called herself a top cop right mm -hmm. um and and you know had some relatively progressive initiatives at the time but also uh communicated a very even dare i say reactionary point of view on other uh in other moments mm -hmm. uh throughout her prosecutorial like throughout her prosecutor uh tenure mm -hmm. i think that um given that when i saw this battleground i thought especially paired up with the reality that like 70 percent of americans want a different uh way forward like they yep. want to change from joseph robin and biden um, I thought that she would run a 2008 Obama style campaign that was like more progressive or rather communicated, uh, actively targeted the harm and communicated the, the, uh, desires of the, of the broader populace. Uh, and I don't think that, I don't think that she did that, uh, to like, I don't think she did that, especially when it comes to like her economic policies. Like there's the good, you got the price gouging, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to lower these costs. We're going to, you're hurting. You're hurting when you go and you purchase groceries. I see that. I, I see you. I hear you. I'm going to fix that. Americans don't care if someone goes and says that's Venezuela, that's communism. That much is yep. clear to me. This policy, when she unfolded it, price gouging, uh, was pulling around 73%. After she, un she unveiled it, and then Republicans launched attacks against it, calling it like, this is Venezuela, this is price yep. caps, you don't want this, uh, this is devastating, uh, this is going to be horrible, you know, Kami Harris, whatever, Comrade Harris, Comrade Kamala, it pulled at 83%, like a, yep. a month later. Americans don't care. They don't. And that's why I was a, a little bit more hopeful, although cautiously optimistic, I guess, when I saw Tim Waltz, because I thought they are going to have to lock in and and communicate to uh, everyone that these policies that are called radical by everyone whether it's the media or whether it's the republicans are actually very helpful like it feeding children is not a radical prospect right mm -hmm. paid family leave is not a radical prospect tim moss actually uh did a really good job communicating that with both um yeah. ezra klein and on numerous occasions before before he was actually selected as a vice president, where he would frame it as like, this is how you help small businesses, right? Paid, yep. like paid medical and family leave. How small businesses would be more competitive with giants, like with, with massive chain retail stores, for example, mom and pop shops can now be more competitive. Sure, you pay, you pay a little bit more in taxes, but at the end of the day, you don't have to pay for all of that. And now you can be competitive against like a Walmart, right? A big chain. Yep. Um, cause those guys can potentially do, uh, you know, paid family leave if, if yeah. necessary, cause they have a lot more leeway. The only thing I'd say, and it's kind of a bleak response though, is you're working, you're working from the premise of public opinion being the most important thing. And that's not always true for them. Right. So things can poll well, they could even be popular among a broader voting base, but things like price gouging were specifically targeted by a kind of elite uh, centrist class, right? They don't, and I think those folks have an outsized amount of power because we know kind of how donors get uh, direct lines to candidates and campaigns. Yeah. I, even when we have talked to the kind of money side of the Democratic Party, it's oftentimes a focus on things like price gouging. They don't, or, or even the FTC coordinator, uh, Lena Khan, has been a yeah. focus for them. And some of the specific kind of progressive pieces of Biden. And so sometimes the reason a candidate backs off from those policies isn't even because it's not polling well or it's not popular, but it's unpopular with the wrong people, frankly. And the, uh, the other thing I would kind of add to this is, you know, Biden had such a long history of being the bipartisan, moderate white guy. His general election challenge was the other side. And he was actually fine with that. He was doing a lot of overt plays for progressives, yeah. a lot of overt messaging on policy. And I think even policy wise, he was willing to kind of embrace uh, more progressive domestic ideas specifically because there was no fear that anyone's going to think Joe Biden is a radical, yeah. you know? There's a different level of cautiousness coming from them 
because she doesn't have that sort of ideological root or story with the public. And so I think they could have taken different strategies on how to actually, uh, uh, you know, deal with that electorally. But it's very clear that the one they've landed on is one that is a moderate centrist signal. And to say, hey, um, I can't be too crazy. Look at me with Liz Cheney. You know, look at me with, uh, you know, I'm tough on immigration. I'll shoot you if you come to my house. You know, whatever. That's clearly the route they've taken. I think they had other options, though. Yeah. So let's let's talk about like the, I guess, successes potentially or maybe the failures of this uh, uh, th this strategy. So in terms of the overall momentum, because it's very hard to look at polls like they're very inconsistent for the most part. Yep. You have a lot of junk polling from the right that tried to, you know, try to sway the real clear politics average like firmly yep. on the Republican side. Uh, and, and I think that that is a deliberate attempt to, yeah. because people want to vote for the party that's winning. Like you want to vote for the winning team anyway, if you're like in the middle still, or you don't really care about Trump all that much. Um, I think that there is a lot of that going on, but beyond that, it's like, I think Trump has always notoriously been a turnout guy with low propensity and mid propensity voters. So those are like yeah. hard to track in general because they're not consistent nor reliable voters. And, um, Given all of that, in a post Roe v. World, uh, Roe v. Wade overturned world, I think that it's it's really difficult to just simply look at polls and make an uh, make an assumption of what's going to happen. So you kind of have to look at the momentum a little bit, and the momentum mm -hmm. certainly favored Kamala Harris early on because I think, uh, sure, once in a blue moon, the donor pressure and the public pressure actually aligned. Because Absolutely. they didn't want to dump millions of dollars to a race that was going to to a candidate that was definitely going to lose, right? Nobody wants yep. people want to return on that investment. So uh, the public response. Having said all of that, the vibes overall were favoring Kamala Harris. The momentum had swung generally in her direction, and yet they cut into that, in my opinion, especially over the last month or so. They cut into that in a in a spectacular fashion with this. Uh, moderate messaging so overall uh i guess my question is like you talk to people all the time for the run-up you talk to some very unique very interesting voters right and what is your what is your overall vibe uh, on the ground yeah. like do the are these people responding positively to it like does it seem do you talk i guess the, the question is do you talk to the podcast voters <laughs> at all because <laughs> i want to know what those do. guys are thinking yeah, I think we do. I mean, I think about someone we talked to for last week's episode who was a 27-year-old who got his, he said he got his news exclusively through Instagram, and he was outside of this Trump event. He had never voted before, and he said that he was going to vote this year. And I was asking him why this year and not previous years. And there was the kind of same, it, it was, a, and honestly, it was a very unintentionally rattling off of Trump talking points. He was saying things just feel a little pricier. And things feel a little more unsafe. And that was more, that was enough for him to kind of feel like he should take a different type of action. I guess to your larger question about momentum, I think I think about it in a broad way. Like before the switch, and you've kind of said this, Democrats weren't even in the game. Like I was, there was no doubt in my mind that Donald Trump was going to win. Um, after there had been, and I think there has been a, a kind of reorganization of the party the only thing I would say is the big difference between 2008 and now is I do think Democrats were more concerned about bringing new people into the process, expanding their coalition, uh, kind of reaching a different type of voter, making it feel more like a movement. I think Donald Trump is the movement candidate of this race. And I, frank and I think Kamala Harris is the Democratic Party. And I think those are an important distinction to really understand. Because Donald Trump's task in this election, I think, is actually a little harder. He has to get all of those Caleb's of the world, the tw the 27-year-olds who are pretty inconsistent, to actually come out yeah. and change the scope of the electorate. Yeah. And that's not an easy thing, even if they're telling pollsters they're interested in you, even if they're telling their friends they're interested in you. Like, those people famously don't always follow through when it comes to it. And we know the Roe v. Wade voter is showing up. Right. Yeah. We know 
that the anti-Trump voter, the MSNBC person, the angry Republican over the last couple of years from those suburbs, we they've already come out in special elections and yeah. terms already. And so I think it's what it's, it's, it's kind of the way I would answer your question is like you just have to re you just have to rethink of who the Democratic Party coalition is. If we were still talking about the Obama era, if we were still talking about them needing a movement, I think they would be in big trouble because I don't think that momentum has continued in the same way. I don't think people see her as the type of movement figure folks saw Obama as. But I don't think that's how they actually win. They win through a more affluent, educated political class. It's less of a movement itself. And so there's the strange thing, I think, where less people voting, or at least a more traditional type of person voting, is better for Democrats. And so at the same time the momentum has blunted, I don't think it changes the overall kind of 51-49-ness of the race. Because frankly, the Democrats weren't banking on that type of person in the first place. They like to say they are, right? They like to, they like to pretend, kind of, that that's still their... They're the voter they're most interested in. Yeah. But it's not the young person. It's not the it's not a mass organization of people of color. Um, it's really a more specific type of person who's actually improved their chances over the last couple of elections. Um, and that's the new Democratic Party. Yeah. So they have a better shot at winning, but it's less of the type of coalition that I think Democrats like to tell themselves. Um yeah, it, it, it's the it's the Chuck Schumer equation. For every two uh, blue collar vote sure. we lose in the in the uh, it, it across the board, we win two in the suburbs. Like we win one in the no. suburbs, or we win two in the suburbs. It's like that's totally what they're thinking. I mean, here in North Carolina, we're about to go out canvassing with people. We're in this suburban area, fast growing. That is their focus: is in converting the kind of diverse suburbs into Democratic voters. And they're actually, if you talk to the Detroit's and Philadelphia organizers. They feel like the campaign isn't as focused on them as previous Democratic campaigns are. But that's partly a tell on the way that the lens of the party has kind of shifted. Yeah, I, I, I really do think that this is um, a dangerous gambit. Like, I, I think it's a very dangerous gamble. I think that, um, like, we'll see. Uh, I, I know that the, the educated, uh, college educated whites in the suburbs are like a, a resilient voting block that consistently yeah. votes, but I don't know if enough of them are going to make up for just simply like the larger number of people that are out there, especially if, if there is some kind of like hemorrhaging from the base that we have seen, right. Especially yeah. with like the the uh the coalitions uh, that that existed within the Democratic Party, I think that they are definitely taking that for granted, um and and we'll see we'll see uh we'll see how it works out. I want to switch gears I mean, for a second. 20, you don't have to look further than 2016, right? A drop off in Milwaukee or Philadelphia, uh, a drop off in Dearborn or Michigan with Arab and Muslim voters. Like the, it could. There's a lot of ways that this could go wrong. And they basically have hemmed themselves in a kind of 270 to 268 type of strategy. Yeah. They are very tied to that Midwestern blue wall. They are very, you know, and so that has to hold. And those type of things, I think, um, coming out of the candidate switch, I think we thought of Harris as having a broad new landscape with the Georgias and Arizonas and all these places on the table. But that requires a real multiracial, multi class movement. And if you limit yourself to really that kind of more traditional voter, that's not, you're not going to do, you're not going to win the Arizonas and Georgias, but you might win the Wisconsin's and Pennsylvania's. Yeah. So um, uh, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, I, I want to hear your perspective on this. There has been some stuff in the last month or so that like in terms of messaging that I feel like is, is hearkening back to a very dark era of the 2016 campaign. Um, I'm uh, specifically referring to Barack Obama talking about yeah. black men and how, you know, oh, I guess y you guys just don't want to vote for Kamala Harris because she's a woman. And I feel like this scoldy tone, I mean, this is like perhaps a private conversation that people might have behind closed doors. But like when you're Barack Obama and you're openly stating that uh, as, yeah. a, as a message, like you know that that is going to get a lot of play in the media. And I think that, there's two different, there's two things there that I am, 
I guess, uh, a little bit frustrated with. One, uh, the, the potential 20% swing for non-college educated male voters, especially yep. under the age of 50, has been consistent for uh, every demographic group. For sure. And black men are uh, black men comprise the smallest percentage of that. So hyper focusing yep. on black men in that regard, I think opens up the door for a lot of conversations that you will hear sometimes even from like white women on CNN who will then turn around and be like, yeah, why aren't they? Why aren't they voting for women? And it's like it's, it's a very weird. Right it's a very weird conversation to have, especially when like. Black people across the board are still overwhelmingly, including black men, are still overwhelmingly yes. voting for the Democratic Party. And I don't think that they I don't think that Democrats understand this as a warning sign of of no. uh, like the base kind of um, the base kind of like falling apart a little bit. And no, I, uh, beyond that, I think like the scold attitude is is I feel like they did this with Hillary Clinton when they saw uh, some issues like, and, yeah. and I think this is like the, the last ditch effort to like try to scold people. And it's a demonstrable failure time and time again. I mean, I gotta say, I hated it. I mean, when I saw what he said and kind of saw the tone in which they were coming at this, it felt really reminiscent of some of the worst versions of democratic messaging. And I think Barack Obama has been pretty like egregious and some of the tone he's come at Black voters with, even while he was president. Oh, I remember yeah. 2016, he talking about, you know, if you don't vote for Clinton, you'll be letting me down personally. I mean, he and I think <laughs> I, the thing that I often come to is say is like, there's no way he would come to different type of voting groups and place the blame on them uh, for their own actions. He would hear those interests. He would uh, he would uh, listen to those frustrations. I was talking to Governor Wes Moore, only black governor in the country, about the question of black men specifically a couple months ago. And he was saying that Democrats have not done the job of acknowledging folks' frustrations of the political system broadly and the role the party has played in it. We know what the research says about what motivates these group of people. And we know that it is part of a larger educational sorting that's not specific to black men. But Barack Obama is missing all of that type of context when he says that. Yeah. I also think it's I also think it completely ignores that for the type of black man we're talking about who's dropped off from Democrats, Obama is an avatar of the party's failures on that issue. Like they are not let ready for a lecture from him. They think that he was part of the problem. And so his inability to kind of see himself in his own kind of time in office as the reason People have shifted on ideas of representation, shifted on uh, the ways that Democrats relate to Black communities is itself kind of a self-fulfilling thing. But to your point about the ways that kind of there's been a larger shift among non-college men, I think Democrats could be honest with themselves. They talk more in the cultural language of Twitter and academia. They talk more about uh, their biggest pitch often in the Black communities is about representation or getting elite Black folks into elite spaces. Yeah, All of those are things that are way more uh, motivating for a college-educated, affluent class of people of color than they are for working-class people of color. And so it's no surprise to me that that is reflected in some of the drop-off here. And I just think they have to ask themselves, like, like do they want to reorient issues to actually speak to these folks? Or is their only message to them one of shame and blame? And I think, like, in this election so far, we've really seen them hit the shame and blame button more than anything else. And I do think that's a big warning sign. Because if they're repivoting to really focus on this type of coalition, a more college-educated one, a more affluent one, I think they're only a Nikki Haley nomination away from getting wiped off the map. Yes. You know? So, like, they... Ha they they are being helped right now because the person on the other side is Donald Trump. And he's so and bad. It has, it's it, not just it Donald not, Trump, but a bad version of him too. A bad version of Donald Trump, yes. And so I'm saying they have not had the inner party discussions and growing pains to really acknowledge what I think has been a big shift from them in terms of the types of issues they talk about and the folks leading that sort of messaging. And so if there's a, a gut check for Democrats, even if they win this election, I think it's how do we talk to folks who did not go to college? How do we talk to folks who are, and, and there was such an assumption, again, this is the same point. They did not think they would have to do this because they assumed 
that people of color would move in their direction to a kind of demographic destiny. That undergirds so much of the overconfidence that Democrats have had over the last six to eight years is because they have felt that inevitably Latino voters would reject Donald Trump or inevitably Black people would reject Donald Trump. And I think the thing that I hope, or maybe hope isn't the right word, but the thing that I think they have to have understood by now is that that type of assumption is not true. Yeah. And there is no, there is no guarantee that the more diverse version of America is a more in- inevitably liberal democracy. Yeah. There's no guarantee of that. And so I think they have to wrestle with that. And it's the big difference between saying the words that Black people aren't a monolith or that Latinos aren't a monolith or whatever, and actually believing and moving like that. Because they know to say it now, but in the end, when you hear Barack's tone, when you hear Obama's tone, he's basically saying that Black men have to do this one thing because they're this one way. Yeah. And that's not a winning message. So you know, also ironically, they have, to, they have to get to that eventually. I just don't think they have the capacity, frankly, or the voices in the room to do that right now. Like scolding of that sort, even if it's correct to a certain degree, should never be deployed as a front facing message. Politics. That's not you it's, can't do that. Yeah. And and I don't know how the Democratic Party has like never really reckoned with that. And I think it's um I don't know if it's like the DC media bubble that they're uh, completely captured by, but like that kind of messaging is not going to, is not going to shake people into going, Oh yeah, I just came to my senses. Like this guy is racist. Right. Yeah. And, and I think they, go can ahead. I say also like it's a consistent problem for them, even in this own election cycle. Part of the reason there was a big underrating of Biden's age as a political problem or a lack of understanding that most people in the country were seeking change rather than the status quo is because there has been a consistent distance from leaders of the party, from the type of like working class, non-college folks who are driving a lot of these changes. There was an assumption, I think from party leaders, that Donald Trump would be inherently unacceptable because of things like January 6th or uh, things like his legal problems. That was a bad assumption too. And so I think if we add up all that we've learned since 2020, you have a consistent story about a Democratic Party whose distance from these type of voters is putting them in pretty bad electoral situations, you know? Now, they might have a little get-out-of-jail-free card because people's distaste for Donald Trump is so high that it could lead them to a slight electoral college victory or even a bigger one, but that's not about them, you know? Yeah. And I still think that eventually these distinctions that they have not wrestled with are going to become very important. And I don't have the evidence over the last couple of years, or frankly, the confidence knowing some of the folks who run these campaigns to believe that they even know enough of these type of people, you know, or like care enough, frankly, about these type of people to really do the type of recalibration I imagine will be necessary. Yeah, I hear I hear a lot of uh you know, I hear a lot of feedback from people that like are in the campaigns and they're mostly just like celebrating the massive war uh, chest that they have. And they they see that as like, you know, Brett summering your way into uh, yeah. the, the November deadline. And it's I think that's a truly terrifying prospect that I personally saw when I went to the DNC. I was like, what the fuck? Like these guys are. I mean, it's very conventional people for very unconventional times. Like and so the playbooks they are using are ones that are not necessarily even in the same language. And so, yeah, they can update it with a meme or with TikTok or whatever. And I think they have been trying to do some of that stuff. But I I don't, I think you got to, both parties, like the the Republicans have already had their their big sea change with Trump. You know, Their, their big rupture came after 2016 when he broke the party. I think Democrats haven't had their moment of reckoning but the signs are there that the fault lines are real enough that they might come. I think the difference between the Republican uh, shift from uh, in the post-Trump world, however, is that he leaned into the base further than previous Republicans had. Whereas I feel like the Democratic Party is constantly moderating against their base, like against the broader population mm-hmm. that time and time again, especially when it's like, associated not with a democrat but like a faceless ballot initiative like a ballot measure 
will vote for the most progressive possible thing, including but not limited to, you know, the expansion of Medicaid, for example. Like, these are the things that people want. They have the capacity, no matter no matter what their, like, weird, dare I say, kind of silly, inconsistent political worldview might look like, when they are staring at something that is going to help them materially, they want it. That's an yep. understandable desire that people have. And it is very frustrating. If you have this charisma gap, for example, I think with Kamala Harris, like she's appealing to suburban voters for sure to a certain degree. But I think like for the broader, uh, for the broader electorate, I don't think she is like uniquely charismatic at all. And I, I think that that like, if you have this, if you have that issue, right? Like even Joe Biden, when his brain was working, was like a relatively solid retail politician. Like he was, yeah. he was great at kissing babies and shaking hands. Like that was something that he did quite well. Um, not to say that he, he couldn't do that in 2020 regardless because of both COVID and because his brain wasn't functioning too well. But um, the, the way to make up for that charisma gap, in my opinion, is by, uh, you know, having solid policies like the price gouging thing, like communi finding the best possible way to communicate uh, how you are going to fix people's issues directly. And then putting that at the forefront of your campaign rather than like vague generalizations about the opportunity economy and how you're going to give small business owners $50,000 in tax cuts. And yeah. um, I haven't seen that at all from the Democratic Party. And it, it is uh, certainly frustrating. Um, there are obviously a lot of gimmies here too. Like one of the biggest ones, of course, is uh, the 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 ongoing atrocities in both Gaza and Lebanon. Uh, something that is profoundly popular uh, across the board. Even majority Republicans want a ceasefire, and the only mechanism to enact that ceasefire is um, fairly simple. It's just one phone call from Biden saying, "We're no longer giving you any weapons if you keep this up." Which Biden, weirdly enough, presented as an opportunity. Now, in the last iteration, as they are, uh, as Israel is is uh, has shut off humanitarian aid into North Gaza as they're pummeling North Gaza, and I found it shocking. Uh, it, like I, I found it, dare I say, spiteful that Biden was pushing the uh, the deadline for a potential embargo if humanitarian aid is still restricted to North Gaza, to after the election. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have to go, so I'm, this might have to be my last answer, but I, but I want to say something to that point. The biggest thing that Democrats can do is respond in policy, is to, is to tell a story that actually motivates folks and combines messenger with message. Now, we've talked a lot about the, the message front, but I also think there's a big piece here about Harris not going through the primary, not getting those type of reps to be able to communicate the differences within the party, how they've changed over the years, and kind of get Democrats on the same front headed into the general election. No matter what happens between now and the next three weeks from now, I still think Joe Biden is the secret main most important person of this race because his, his inability to step aside, stop the party, from being able to have an open conversation with itself about what it believes. And I think that type of conversation could have been a motivating or jolting thing in an election where apathy is just as big of a deal as the choices in front of them. And so sometimes it feels as if they run from having these conversations in an attempt to be everything to everyone rather than actually answer people's concerns on that front. And we should say Republicans have an easier job on this front. They have a more monochromatic base. They have a base that believes more of the same thing that is more alike than the Democratic one, right? Yeah. Diversity is actually a challenge for Democrats because not everyone believes the same thing on a lot of stuff. But one of the things I do think is true is that hiding from it is not going to be the most helpful. And I also think that they have been avoiding, I mean, ever since 2016, they have been a reactive party to Donald Trump rather than an affirmative party laying out a kind of vision. I think the last time Democrats had that sort of conversation was in an Obama era, where there was like a vision that was being laid out. Yeah. And Biden won, frankly, by saying, it says this primary should not really be about vision. It should be about who can beat Donald Trump. Yeah. That has just delayed this inevitable conversation within the party further and further and further. And so even if Kamala Harris wins, I still don't think that solves that front because she's more of a weather vane for where the party exists 
than she is setting an agenda going forward. And so I just think that eventually these chickens will come home to roost. And whether it's this election that kind of hurts them on that front, or if it's a kind of open party question or where they go on issues like immigration or the like going forward, they're going to have to wrestle with this stuff. And even things like foreign policy cannot be things that they put aside any longer. They have an increasingly diverse electorate, increasingly first generation. Coming, Black and Latinos are coming from different parts of the country. They don't look the same as they looked 50, 40, 50, 40, yeah. 50 years ago. And so they're going to have to actually, I think, spend time on issues that they have not considered and frankly have benefited from not considering. Even if you take foreign policy, my last point, back in 2020, there were so many differences between all those candidates. But basically, bar Bernie Sanders, most of them believed exactly the same thing when it came to Israel. Yeah. Most of them believed exactly the same thing when it came to a lot of foreign policy questions. I think that's changed among Democrats. And so where they fall now is going to be wide, is going to be a bigger, more open question. And we just, we frankly won't know until after this election because they're going to punt that as far as they can. Yeah. All right. I said, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, yeah, it was wonderful you. having you. Appreciate it. You're brilliant as always, and I uh, I hope to have you on again. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you all for checking this out and check out the run-up, too. Um, and we're going to have some fun before the election comes. But thank you for having me. All right. Bye. All right. That was a said Herndon of the run-up uh, podcast on the New York Times. Uh, he's a brilliant reporter. Uh, fantastic conversation as always. You know, it's it's uh, it's great to see, you know, people that are uh, uh, very prominent members of of mainstream media that are especially by design because he has to have his eyes on the road directly like he is he is directly talking to voters on a regular basis like i love i love talking to people like that in particular just like dave um because they get to see so many broad perspectives so great interview overall um was he driving no he wasn't driving you're crazy no, he was he was parked. Um, anyway, so yeah, I hope uh, I hope that was a, at least a little bit more instructive, or a little bit more informative for you guys. Um, you said he had to keep his eyes on the road. No, I meant like on the campaign trail. Chat. Yeah. Also, he's in North Carolina. He has to avoid the anti-FEMA militias. Okay. Oh man. So yeah, that is uh, that is interesting to hear from. What do you think about making the left more masculine? <laughs> That's a funny, funny question. Do you think if the Dems lose is, uh, lose is squarely Biden's fault? No, I, I think it's the, I mean, we, the conversation we just had is, is the, the entirety of the Democratic Party has like refused to reckon with the reality of what the American electorate wants and desires. This is something that I consistently point to with the 2016 election, 2016 primaries in particular. Hillary Clinton was a representation of like elite Democratic Party machine, right? And a lot of voters despise that so much so that they voted for an old Jewish socialist, right? In overwhelming numbers, as a matter of fact. And obviously, at the end of the day, uh, with superdelegates and the media support, that campaign got packed up, especially because Bernie was never able to make it past the finish line and get to the general and see if that would uh, help with the broader turnout strategy. But having said that, I think that the reason why the Democrats lost in 2016 beyond, uh, beyond the Bernie stuff is because they were not responsive to the anger and resentment that a lot of people feel about the way things are going after eight years of, of Barack Obama, right? This is the reason why I always point to that is because a lot of people have short-term memory and they, and they look at uh, the differences in the economy between 2020 and now, right? And they say, well, the economy is rebounding. I don't understand. Like, why wouldn't people actually uh, refuse to reckon with that? And what a lot of people don't, what, what a lot gets lost in that conversation is that regardless of uh, the economy rebounding or regardless of the soft landing or whatever, these like vague concepts that people cannot comprehend because they're just, they know that inflation hit them already, um, is that in spite of all of that, people were already angry before COVID, right? 
That's the reason why I point to 2016. Like there was already an anger and resentment that was brewing within the base that that existed before COVID, before Donald Trump. That that anger and resentment and a lack of interest in dealing with that is what got us Donald Trump. And I think continuing with this strategy of hyper focusing on people that are better off, people that have hired uh people that have higher uh, uh, education and, and going after the low propensity voters, I think is going to, especially when you are using all of the opportunity, all of the opportunity you have on the communications front to normalize right-wing sentiment, to normalize right-wing framing on every single issue, you are creating an environment that is never going to be hostile to Republican ideas at all and the moment that you have a competent Republican is going to be a moment where they run the table, Reagan style. Yeah. I think he was 100% right when he said that this new Dem coalition is collapsing as soon as the GOP nominates a Haley like candidate. This is the decency coalition, and I doubt it will survive a post Trump election. Exactly. Now, this isn't to say that the Republicans don't have like larger, more holistic problems within their own uh, campaigning as well. Uh, the Republicans have designed the situation uh, that will cook them inevitably that like nobody that can make it out. the Nobody that is like a Haley style candidate is making it out the primary unless I guess all the options are Haley style candidates. OK, uh, but overall, overall, I think there is a there is a real <laughs> there's a real problem uh, in in the um, there's a real problem in the what is this? Hamas is bad. Hassan sucks. On God, cut. Sinwar deserved it. Thanks for your valuable feedbook, feedback and input chatter. Um, is there a competent Republican currently? Someone may be green now, but it could be more dangerous for Dems later. I mean, even a fucking J.D. Vance, dude. Yeah. I mean, the J.D. Vance that I saw on that VP debate and the J.D. Vance that I've seen thus far on the New York Times interview, for example, um, is, is a, a scary scary jd vance a scarier jd vance than the jd vance that you saw on the podcast that is is gross and uh, frustrates people right he is a chameleon he's very good he's like a pete buddha judge he's very good at um adopting different shapes and presenting himself depending on which audience he's talking to um he's getting better at pretending to be human and he is very comfortable in those liberal spaces because he is a liberal. So in terms of like the liberal intelligentsia stuff, like he has an easier shot winning back those Kamala Harris coalition voters and bringing them firmly back to the Republican Party where they already were and where they belong uh, than, than Donald Trump is. He is probably worse off at uh, captivating the fucking hogs, you know? <clears throat> so... He needs to get better with the donor show worker demographic. Yeah. Uh, Felix says Trump's biggest asset in 2016 was independent. Seeing him as more the moderate of the two choices. That's not value judgment. That's an objective fact about voter perceptions. Why in the fuck, why in the fuck world would your message be? He's actually more moderate than he claims. Yeah, I know. Um, the hypocrisy baiting stuff is really stupid. Although I will say something that may be considered controversial in this community. I do think that the way that Kamala Harris handled the trans question on the Fox News broadcast with uh, Brett Baer was not as hypocrisy focused, but actually was relatively solid, not just for the Fox audience in general, but I think it was a solid way to talk about it as in like, who cares? It was fine when he did it. It's fine when we did it. Like, shut the fuck up about this. Okay, this is let's get back to the kitchen table issues. I think that is the expert way of of just neutralizing the the anti-trans uh narratives that that republicans desperately want to put at the forefront he pivoted away from the transphobia ish closed that door fast and made brett back down yeah exactly lawless on respectfully you're dumb on the trans question what do you mean i don't think a normal republican can turn out rule of voters in the same way trump can um no but they still have their base like evangelicals are always going to vote and they're a r resilient voting block for the Republicans. Waltz had an even greater answer to it. It was fantastic.
Walls pulled no punches, calling out the anti-trans uh, attack ads for fomenting hate and demonizing a minority to maintain political power. Um, here's the quote that was really good. I think this is the one, right? The line of questioning came midway through the interview where Waltz was asked about what the administration would do for queer kids. You can see the Waltz full response here. Tim Waltz. Yeah, well, there's certainly things we can codify into law. We know the hate crimes that come against this, making sure the education is out there. It starts with making sure that those kids are safe in the schools. They're safe in, they're safe in their persons. I think the platform being able to talk about this makes a big difference. But I also think, Abby, your point is on this. I was just mentioning, we need to appoint judges who uphold the right to marriage, uphold the right to be who you are. I'm proud to be on a uh, way, uh, making sure that that's the case. Uphold the right to get medical care you need. We should not be naive. Those appointments are really, really important. I think that's what the vice president is committed to. Um, wait, uh, no, I think this, not the judges. He, there was another thing that he, oh, here, here, this is the one, yeah. We're out here trying to make the case, that access to health care and a clean environment. This is the banger message. Sorry. This is like, it's not just buzzwords, chatters. This is, this is I think, the best possible angle of attack here. We're out here trying to make the case that access to healthcare in a clean environment and manufacturing jobs and keeping your local hospital open. Those are the things that people are really concerned about. They're running millions of dollars of ads, demonizing folks that are just trying to live their lives. That is perhaps the best mathematically calculated response to all of the trans panic shit that you can arrive at that is Tim Waltz doing Tim Waltz shit. The problem, however, is that this is relegated to the, you know, to the, to the random podcasts of the world and is not the primary communication strategy of the party itself. And that is very frustrating. And for the record, a version of this, a version of this also exists for anti-immigrant sentiment, right? Like it is damn near identical. Hassan, you talk way too much about the trans stuff. Are you by chance a trans dog? This is such a funny thing to say because this question in and of itself, and I know you're like trolling or whatever, but this question in and of itself basically destroys the conception that like gender norms are, are uh, binary and, and rigid. Okay. You know what I mean? Y do you understand that? You understand that you're like openly recognizing the reality? I think it's not as effective for immigrant stuff because people don't interact with that many trans people on a daily, but they do interact with immigrants and form a bigoted relationship and view them wrong. 100% wrong on the immigrant stuff. It's actually even more successful because of the lack of access to like a random normal trans person that people might have, right? Everybody is around immigrants, both undocumented and documented all the fucking time. And that's precisely the reason why in the polling data, if you dive a little bit deeper into polls on the way that the Americans, the way that the American population views immigration in this country, 60% say they want mass deportations and 60 plus percent still say they want mass amnesty, a pathway to citizenship. It's the idea that the immigrant that you don't know is actually responsible for all of these crimes, but the immigrant that you do know is good, is a hard worker. Okay. And the Democrats, it's same poll. Is that from the same poll? Yes. Same fucking poll. It is so shocking if you're oblivious to how Americans uh, believe contradictory things, but it is expected if you are familiar. That sounds like racism with extra steps. Yeah, no shit. All the immigration conversation revolves around uh, white nativist ideals. Yes, that is racist. Inherent. Uh, inherent uh, uh permissible white supremacist talking points that's what it is <clears throat> so median voter undefeated it's not necessarily just a median voter it's just like every american voter is like this when we're talking about percentages like 60 plus percent that's like damn near the entirety but yeah he then turned the role that coming out plays in advancing Making a plea, in advancing acceptance making a plea to parents to accept their kids and explaining how we can move uh, people to a place of acceptance you're reaching a lot of folks in hearing this. And for some people, it's not even out of malice. It's not, and it's not a pejorative. It's out of ignorance. They maybe have not been around people. You've all seen this, however it takes you to get there. But I know it's a little frustrating when you see folks have an epiphany when their child comes out to them. That's good. We're glad they got there. You'd like to think that empathy would be there. But I think especially for older folks, they want to do right, but they don't really understand. And when they see these guys trying to demonize and make things scary, that's where I think family members can just come out and say, look, here's what you should understand about this community. 
Here's what you should know. It feels to me like that goes a long ways. We're winning public opinion and we need to continue to do that. But I don't want us to get too far away from uh, we need to also make sure that the power that protects these rights is in place too. So I think that uh, I think that uh, Tim Waltz is is this is another one of those like uh, this is another one of those instances where he's just like when you let his freak flag fly, he just pops off pretty hardcore. Um, I just wish he wasn't in the cuck corner all the time. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and shackled and muzzled by the establishment Democratic Party that sees him as like a weird radical that's going to be off putting to the fucking broader base of support. While they simultaneously trot him out as like a coach that shoots guns. Come on, go shoot your guns and and be a coach. Shut the fuck up about like your actual worldview. And that's what's that's what's like uh, really frustrating about this kind of thing. Like you have you have a golden boy and you've muzzled him. I don't like that. I think it's it's really 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 stupid. Um, did you talk about the thirty day deadline that Biden did? Yes, I did. Um. <clears throat> You are 100% spot on with the Nikki Haley comment. She's, um, Mr. Zogby's frustration reflects that and an, and an acknowledgement among some Harris campaign operatives that the damage with a small but potentially crucial subset of voters has been done, especially in Michigan. The battleground state has one of the largest Arab and Muslim populations in the country, and those voters signaled long ago that they were angry with Biden administration over the war. The path to victory in a state like Michigan, Harris campaign officials are betting, is through suburban counties that are home to many college-educated and white voters. That includes a slice of more than 296,000 voters who supported Nikki Haley in the state's Republican presidential primary race. Ms. Harris's visits to suburban areas of Michigan and Wisconsin this week underscored where she and her advisors believe she can win. Paul Bless says she's not going to, uh, she's not going to for the same reason she's given nothing to the anti-war movement so far. She wants to be seen as more pro-Israel candidate. The Harris campaign is forfeiting Arab American voters in Michigan, hoping to offset the loss through white suburbanites. The only Democrats who are honest about this are the ones who say there aren't enough Arab Michigans and there aren't enough Arab Americans in Michigan to tip the scale against her. I don't know if it's accurate, but it's better than pretending she's going to suddenly run an anti Netanyahu ad 18 days before the election. Yeah. She wants votes from the anti-Zionist protesters out. No, she does not. She does not. I don't think you guys understand. She does not. She has openly communicated that if you care about this sort of thing and you want to vote on that basis, you are not a part of the party. I mean, that's it. I think it makes it easier. My, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu about it. He's uh, called me, yes. He's called me. I have not spoken. I'm going to speak to him probably now. Well, look, he's doing a good job. Biden is trying to hold him back. Just so you understand, Biden is far superior to the to the VP. Uh, he's trying to hold him back, and he probably should be doing the opposite. Actually, I'm glad that VP decided to do what he had to do. But it's uh, he's moving along. Yes, you have clearly. Uh, Obvious, you are a Jewish supporter, anti-Zionist as I am. Please stop anti-Semitism in chat. What? Are you okay, chatter? What is happening? Yeah, so people are looking at this and going, oh, you should just use this. You should run this ad targeting Arab American voters in Michigan. It's like, I don't think they care, you know? I, I don't think they care enough. I think that they have made this electoral calculation. I, I don't know if, we'll, if it will get them across the finish line, but it certainly will not in the next election cycle. Does that make sense? That's the... Like, even if they were to, even if they are to win and their chances are looking worse and worse every single day, <clears throat> um, there's still a likelihood that they will win, right? But the problem here is, the problem here is that that coalition that they're trying to laser in on will inevitably go back to the Republican Party, no matter how aggressive or right wing the Republicans are, as long as the Republican Party maintains messaging discipline and doesn't go as hard as trump does that's it down to the wire every single person that you meet most likely at a certain point has heard something that trump has said that they do not like and this absolutely includes trump voters if you ask trump voters like what do you think about trump they'll be like ah, i don't really like the some of the things he says but he's my guy right like that's such a common that's such a commonly held perspective amongst Trump supporters. Okay. That to me, 
means that if it's not Donald Trump, someone who might be as charismatic as Donald Trump, that's really, really difficult to find. But if it's uh, someone who doesn't go as far and as beyond as Donald Trump, like, you know, and, and running around and being like, yeah, immigrants are, you know, poisoning the blood of the nation and that they're going to fucking eat your pets or whatever, like you're going to have a really hard time beating a person like that. Um, even into recent days, people have spoken with close Biden advisors. They have heard complaints that the president would not would be in the same spot or better right now had he stayed in the race. One Dem veteran consultant, that's literally insane. Yeah, that's not correct, for the record. That's really stupid. They should have literally... They, they, no, they would not be in the same place. What the fuck are these guys talking about? What are they smoking on? No, he would be like... On the national polls, would be fucking minimum five points uh, underwater, perhaps maybe even uh, a, a larger percentage. It is crazy. Okay. You are out of your fucking mind. Like, the only reason why you think that is because you haven't heard his brain, you haven't heard his brain leaking out of his ears on national television in quite some time. And that's why you're like, oh, well, you know, people like him. His approval ratings went up when he dropped out of the race, dog. Like, they hated him so much that they were like, oh, thank God he fucking left. Okay, give me a fucking break. You're so stupid. Anyway, in mid-September, the Democratic and Research Polling Initiative Blueprint conducted a national poll testing a long series of potential statements Harris could make about herself and Biden. Those that performed best, the polling found, were those that displayed a clear break between her and Biden, while those that performed worse were those that portrayed a future Harris administration as building on the accomplishments of the Biden era. Any mention of Biden, the polling found, led to less support even at the position it had Harris, uh, it had Harris talk, uh, taking was the same. Even if you're going to lean on the Biden administration's accomplishments, it is best to not admit that it is Joseph Robinette Brandon's accomplishments because people don't like him. Very, very dumb that the Democratic Party is like, nah, we are Biden. Mike from PA, Harris is completely fumbled by turning to the right and has totally cratered her support among young people and black people, pathetic and deserved. Please tell me how interested you are in this election uh, in November using a scale from 1 to 10. Share of registered voters responding 9 or 10. Okay? We are at 64%. It's lower than Hillary Clinton for black voters. And 18 to 34-year-old voters, 54% to 49%. That is fucked up early surge was entirely with young people and people of color in hopes that she would represent progressive change her entire campaign since then has been spitting in the progressive faces and thus she will lose this data from the right after the dropout proving it um i think overall i am not as assured as michael from pennsylvania is in terms of like uh, kamala harris's like definite electoral defeat although i am i am certainly worried about it i do think that I do think that there is a every day that goes by, I think the likelihood that she will lose gets uh, higher. And that is not good when you have 17 days until the election. OK, are people less enthused? Yeah, they will vote for Trump or not vote. I doubt it. Yeah, I um, will see. Yeah, but this poll doesn't mean crap. I mean, the trend of younger person not being as active in an election has been a trend in almost all countries. No, I think that there's a lot of fucking people under the age of 35 that if you activated, you could actually swing like a shit ton of districts. The problem is we just never try. We don't ever fucking actively try that shit. Like, here's what doesn't work for under 35 year olds, okay? Telling them to shut the fuck up and vote. You can have a million Harry Sassans vote scolding people over and over again. People just don't give a shit. They're like, I don't care. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Like, and you also cannot find a better strategy of communicating uh, the campaign policies if the campaign policies are kind of shitty. Like, I don't know how else to describe this, right? Like, you cannot find a good way to massage right-wing framing on these issues. And that's why Tim Walsh fails spectacularly when talking about, like, nuking Iran or fucking talking about immigrants and how we're going to pack them up ourselves. We're the anti-immigrant party. Like that's dumb. You can't do that. You're just not going to fucking win on that front. So what, ha what remains in that situation? Trump did January 6th, which, you know, obviously a lot of older voters or, uh, you know, election lovers such as yourself care about that. But I don't think the broader population gives a shit about that. Right. Um, like it doesn't matter for, I think about, 
What? This guy literally said something so anti-Semitic in defense of Asmongold. That's so funny. He said, this guy said, Asmongold said nothing wrong, which by the way, you should check in with Asmongold because he thinks he said something wrong. And then he turned around and said, you've said worse about tiny hat people. As in, he's saying, like, he's using an anti-Semitic way of referring to Jews. Like, how am I supposed to assume that you are not a Nazi here and, and assume that you're, like, actually someone who cares about anti-Semitism as you refer to Jewish people as tiny hat people? The fuck is wrong with you, dude? That's insane. Like, he couldn't even hide his, like, perspective. He couldn't even, like find a better way to communicate that to like virtue signal as though he does care about Jewish people by literally being anti-Semitic. It's fucking hilarious. Right? Okay. <laughs> I'm voting for Kanye. Fuck it. Okay. Chatter. There's nothing funnier than, <laughs> there's nothing funnier than being anti-Semitic while simultaneously being like, I really care about anti-Semitism and you're presenting it. You're being very anti-Semitic right now. Nick had a great statement for the Asmongol people, even attacking Asmongol for his willingness to Defenders, change. Defenders, y'all are so fucking cringe. Listen, he is our friend. He's not yours. You don't need to go harass everything OTK related for, his, for him. Okay? You guys look like fucking losers. Stop it. Like, holy shit. I cannot. He don't know you, little bro. Stop. He's our friend. We talk to him daily. We know him more than you do. Grow up. Go focus on yourselves. Get a job. Go to the gym. It is pathetic. Like, after every single OTK tweet just getting harassed, it's insane. Stop. Stop. Like, stop. Like, it's, it's crazy. It is crazy. Like, I, I, I've never seen this before. Like, stop. Y'all are making his community... He's throwing, he's throwing them in the grinder, I horrible. think. Like, horrible. Please stop. For love of God. Like, we know him. You do not. Just because you watch him all day. Holy moly. I haven't been getting a lot of, like... Uh, Asmongold supporters in here that's like that that chirp at me though to be honest it's crazy like i, I, I haven't I really seen that that I, much i never even say shit yeah like i think they they just don't even come around these parts or we probably banned them a long time ago they're just like mostly on reddit like this but like fuck off on the mod side it's not even that bad we had a handful but even some of them were immediately apologetic yeah i don't know uh I think it's weird to get mad at everybody, including like yelling at Asmongold as a fan of Asmongold because he said that he recognizes that he did something wrong. Like it's a, it's a wild, wild situation that people grow. Um, anyway, uh, Peter Alexander, what is one policy you would have done differently over the last three years and a half as uh, then President Biden? We that every president has to cut their own path. What is one policy that you would have done differently over these last three and a half years than President Biden? I mean, to be very candid with you, you even including Mike Pence, um, vice presidents are not critical of their presidents. I think that really actually, in terms of the tradition of it and also just going forward, it does not make for a productive and important relationship. He's now I don't think that's a good, I don't think that's a good message. You got to be like, I'm expanding on, a, I, I'm, I'm building a new pathway for the future or something. You know what I mean? There's a lot I can do, and there's a lot of limitations to the to the position itself. Like, I think um, I think given the constraints of the job uh, is is one thing that speaks to why I can't make these changes right now. But the American people will vote for the change that they want to see in me. Like, just simply saying, just simply saying that like I'm a VP to Biden and I ride or die with him is is so dumb, especially when. As Biden's vice president, you were chosen to replace him because he was objectively unpopular. I was giving you that green light with his comments that you can carve your own path. So now that you have this ability to yeah, say that to be on your own? Well, no, going forward, there is no question that I bring my own experiences and my own life experiences. And is there career. a policy that stands out to you in particular either? Sure. I mean, my approach to what we need to do around Medicare covering home health care, born out of my experience. Oh my gosh, she's like trying to, she's trying to do patchwork uh, on the, on the blueprint messaging front. She's trying to hit the, she's trying to hit those, uh, 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 hit the, hit the positive policies that she saw, uh, you know, play well. No, she has said something about Medicare. It's correct. This is a actual policy that is overtly popular. When I first heard it on The View, I said as such, I told you guys, the moment that she unveiled that she was going to expand Medicare to at-home care. I was like, that's great. I call balls and strikes, chat.
I call motherfucking balls and strikes. Every single... The reason why I keep going back to this blueprint thing is because this verbatim is like straight up everything that I have said for the past couple of months, okay? When she talks about good policies that are progressive, that help people's like material problems, it portrays well, it plays well for the broader electorate. They like it. They're like, I'm hurting here. I'm glad that she's going to address that. That is normal. Okay. That's normal. Of course. Of course, people are going to be like, yeah, man, why the fuck would I vote for you? Oh, you're going to do something for me? I like that. Okay. Now, this isn't even to say that she's going to do any of this. I'm just, at this point, I, I, we, we are so captive to reactionary framing on issues that I'm just like, like, she won't even lie to people, you know? I'm like, lie to the American public, please. Oh, it's very, very, very stupid to not do this. And the things that I hate, small business stuff, like the hyper focus on giving tax cuts to a person that wants to launch a small business plays very poorly. Who would have thought? And the worst of it all being that she would put an actual Republican in the cabinet. It's like, you're not a Republican. This is not the Republican primary that's happening on November 5th. Okay, Barry Balls. Thank you for the 100 community gifted subs during this freaking hype train. That's crazy. Allowing 100 people to no longer see the ads at the top of the hour. That's wild. What a time to be alive, Harry Balls. Barry Balls, sorry, not Harry Balls. Here's the three minute ad break now, chat. Parents have taken care of my mother. Um, my priority on housing one because i know what it means like all of the personal anecdotes that she shows attack on to the policy i'm sorry people might get mad at me about this but like i think when she talks about the personal anecdotes it comes across as robotic and insincere it comes across as inauthentic please don't yell at me and tell me that i am like anti-black or anti-woman or whatever i'm just telling you how i read it and if i read it and I am susceptible to her framing on the issue because I like the policies that she's talking about, then I suspect that a lot of people that have way more hangups than I do, okay, because I have none. I don't give a fuck what someone's background is. I only care about what they're saying and what they're going to do. I just, I don't know. I think that that is a, an overt problem with the way that Democrats are perceived. And I think that... uh. I think that that is a big, that's another part of the messaging gap, another part of the messaging issue. Bro, she's committing genocide, but you like her policies? Uh, my friend, that's neither here nor there. Should I put the hat on? I have a hat for this. I have two different hats. When I'm talking about Kamala Harris's policies and talking about the electoral calculation here, doing the rat race, I'm putting my fucking DC wonk analyst hat on. When I'm talking about the Republican Party, for example, and how far they go, okay, in terms of like messaging a radical agenda that comes across as overtly gross and racist, okay, I'm talking about it from the perspective, not because I agree with the Republican Party at all, nor the Democratic Party as, uh, for that matter, but from the perspective of, will this help them win the election? Do you understand? Do you get it? I don't think you get it, but it's okay. Serial wanker. This guy. <laughs> what the fuck? Dude, why are you making it like America Kaka wants a ceasefire? There's literally nothing isn't real does that without America Kaka approval. Do you think Kamala is Hillary 2.0 or is she doing something better or worse? I think that Kamala Harris is Hillary 2.0 for sure, but she doesn't have the baggage that Hillary has. Uh, so... She is, uh, her favorables are better than Hillary Clinton. That much is a certainty, you know? Anyway, do you have a hat that you put on when you are uh, talking about an organized militia movement in the third world? Yes, I do. I've, I wear many hats. Affordable housing and the ability to buy a home. Again, my own experience, my mother saved up and not until I was a teenager was she able to do it. But also I know that for so many young people who I speak with around our country, the American dream is just really out of reach. So my policy about $25,000 down payment assistance to help them get their foot in the door. The work that I have been doing and will bring to the presidency around emphasizing small businesses as being part of the real... Oh, shut the fuck up. Never talk about small businesses ever again. Shut Back up. America's economy. 
those are the experiences and the ideas that I have that are about moving forward and really in being a part of the next generation of leadership in America. Last one, I know I got. Ugh, I hate the small business shit, dude. It's so bad. It is so fucking bad. All right, um, let's get to, I already served the three minute average at the top of the hour. I don't know why people are fucking still trying to debate me or whatever. Let's talk about Yahya Sinwar. Okay. Yahya Sinwar became the Politburo chief of uh, Hamas, w was already the, uh, the leader of the military wing of Hamas and is seen as the uh, person who was most responsible for I don't want to use the term masterminding because I feel like a lot of people are going to say, oh, you're being fucking uh, anti-Semitic or whatever the fuck. Um, what's a better word than that? Um, coordinating the October 7 attacks on Israel and yeah, the planner, the designer, the architect. Yes, orchestrating. Um, so there's the raw footage of Yahya Sinwar's last moments. Uh, this doesn't actually show any any blood or anything but uh israel weirdly enough presented this i think because they thought like look how sick this is like we killed him he died he's a loser but uh the reality of the matter is that i think this will probably i mean i think this is like something that will backfire um considering that it shows it it completely contradicts a lot of the messaging surrounding uh, Yahya Sinwar and the way that he was presented to uh, to be like surrounded by 20 hostages that he's handcuffed to and that he was in a tunnel structure always like consistently hiding uh, it, and and that's not the case at all his arm is severed in the video yeah his arm uh, was shot off I believe by like uh, our, the first artillery shell I will give you the details of what happened, what took place two days, I guess two days ago, yesterday. Um, but uh, basically, uh, there were, there's constant 24-7 uh, surveillance. And, and uh, in that 24-7 uh, surveillance within the Gaza Strip, they, found, they saw like a bunch of militants, the Israeli army, a bunch of militants that they suspected, or maybe Palestinians, I don't know, being suspicious. That's enough to fucking uh, attack them. But, um, what is this? Written word to understand the Israeli psyche is fire. I'm Elon Gilad, I write about Hebrew and Jewish history. Let's take a look at the central concept of Israeliness, starting with its etymology. The word comes from the criminal jargon of Russia in the early 20th century, where it was used to mean non-criminal, and by extension, someone who may easily be exploited, a mark. The word comes from the Yiddish word fire, meaning a customer of a prostitute, a john, which itself probably comes from a German word meaning suitor. Now, this word arrived in Israel with Russian immigrants in the 1950s, where it took on a life of its own in Hebrew. The closest word in English to flyer is sucker, but it's so much more. It's a cultural touchstone that reveals the heart of Israeli society. You see, in Israel, being a flyer doesn't just mean you're easily fooled. It's more about missing the chance to cut corners, dodge rules, or get ahead by any means necessary. In a society where bending the rules is often seen as savvy, being a flyer means you're the one who plays it straight. And that's not a compliment. In fact, being called a file is one of the worst insults out there. Sociologists have noted that the concept of file is closely linked to the Israeli national identity. To be Israeli in many ways is to be aware of the constant risk of being a file and to navigate life with the sharpness and savvy needed to avoid that fate. This mentality is seen as a defining feature of what it means to be Israeli, shaping everything from personal interactions to national policies. Now, you know what? Seem, it's not passing the smell test what are you talking about this guy's this guy is not like a random dude this is a, a this is a jewish guy who writes about hebrew and jewish history the fuck like talking about culture in israel where's time without an ovo when you need him god damn um talking about cultural undertones in israeli society i think is important to understand i didn't know i, I didn't know about this um to begin with but but like something that we talked about, something that we talked about before uh, is like the way that the Holocaust is, is viewed, the way that the, Holo the, way that the Holocaust is review, uh, viewed in Israeli society and like what role it plays in understanding contemporary uh, Israeli mindset. 
He's paraphrasing an article from 99 about this concept. Yeah, he's not like a fucking random person. Anyway, he's an editor and writer at Haaretz, uh, who also, um, I get, I get, I, I didn't even know about this concept, but I, I kind of understand what he's saying that like, um, but as far as, um, as far as like the militancy, for example, the militant attitudes baked into the, the way that never again is perceived by broader, uh, Israeli society. When you're building a nation, when you're, when you're creating a nationalist mythos, there are a lot of things that you, there are a lot of cultural perspectives that you point to that you create bm on twitter retweeted this article yeah um anyway colonizers think that dying is the worst fate and that dying fighting is dumb if you can live as a slave they have to believe that otherwise they can't rationalize themselves so israel's release of yahya sinwar's final moments serves as propaganda to showcase strength and humiliate palestinians reflecting israeli narcissism while israelis interpret his death as a victory others see it as a symbol of resistance and martyrdom highlighting different perspectives on life sacrifice and struggle that's a that's a pretty solid way to look at it. I think that a lot of people that watch the footage, um, I think a lot of people that watched the, the raw footage or this drone footage, like when I saw it, I could not comprehend why they had released this, especially considering that overall, the way that, uh, the way that this played out is that they didn't even know that they actually ended up targeting and killing Yahya Sinwar. They thought that they were just targeting and killing random Palestinians. Basically, they see three people that they, uh, that they think are suspicious. Those three people scatter. There's like a firefight. Um, one of them runs into this building. The building is shelled. Okay. Originally, uh, I believe that uh, the early reporting from Israeli uh, media was that whoever it was in that building lobbed grenades. But then that could have been a mistranslation. I, I know that the grenades were involved, but I don't know if it was actually the person that was in the building, Yahya Sinwar, which we know now, or, or rather the people that were following him. Tank, not artillery. Yes, a tank shelled the building. They run away. Like the soldiers, the Israeli soldiers run away. Then they send in a drone. This is the drone footage. The suspicious figure, the bloodstain, and the shell to Building 42. New details about Sinwar's assassination. Israel confirms the IDF didn't find Sinwar. Sinwar found them. He emerged suddenly in plain view, shot through grenades. The IDF troops got wounded and took cover in a building where he continued to throw sticks, rocks, and grenades while the IDF shelled the place from a distance. Um, this is the article. Uh, basically, what ends up happening in this process is, um, this is the drone footage and you'll see. He's right there, sitting with a kafia over his head, in military fatigues, with a vest on, and you can kind of tell, even in this grainy footage, that his arm is gone. Like, his one arm is, is just blasted off. They didn't know at the time that this was Yahya Sinwar. So, they turn around. Once they identify that there's a, there's a militant in the room, okay, with the drone, they send the tank back, and the tank, and the tank basically shells uh, this area once again. And the next day, they're doing a sweep to see what they you know, what they conducted, what the, what the operation they conducted ended up um, looking like. And that's where they find the body of Yahya Sinwar. He recognizes the drone is there. He picks up uh, a wooden stick and tosses it in the direction of the drone. And then, uh, yeah, oh, here's the, here's the details. Then a tank and other troops arrived at the scene. At this point, Sinwar went up the second floor of the building where he was hiding and a tank fired a shell at him. Sinwar was apparently wounded by the tank fire and lost his hand. After soldiers entered the building, he threw two grenades at them and they rolled down the staircase. Soldiers retreated and used the drone to scan the building. Then the drone spotted a masked man with an injured hand. Sinwar saw the drone and threw a piece of wood at it. At this point, the tank fired another shell at him. Okay. Which I think that it is interesting that they, uh, they presented this. Like it didn't make any sense to me that they like openly presented well, this. Um, and I like in terms of, uh, in terms of this being like a, like a massive W for the Israeli military, of course, this is a very high-profile target for them. This is the, the, the architect of October 7. This is uh, the person that is uh, the leader of the al qassam Brigades. A lot of people actually were very upset about the Gilad Shalit uh, hostage uh, negotiation in the hostage swap where a thousand uh, Palestinians that were imprisoned by the Israeli state were, were uh, allowed to be released in, uh, for the return of one singular Gilad Shalid. One of those people was 
Yahya Sinwar, I've actually listened to, I believe his name is David Remnick, who even read his book and has talked about his background quite a bit. Uh, he had a conversation with uh, Ezra Klein a while ago. Um, but um, I guess we'll, we'll, I'll give you more details on his background uh, after we talk about... Long before the attacks of October the 7th last after year. After we talk yeah, about yeah, like, the, the was... details surrounding, uh, uh, surrounding the, the death of Yahya Sinwar. The top of any notional Israeli target list. A former internal enforcer, a former prisoner in Israel since 2017, the head of Hamas in Gaza. Why would it be, be in the front lines, though? There's Hamas-like men now. I think that that is one way to interpret the situation. And I'm yes, Hamas's uh, ranks have obviously uh, been diminished in the last fucking 12 months of a genocide. But I think the other reason is that um, the other reason why he was in the front lines is because, one, all of Gaza is a front line. And two, uh, at least in terms of like how he has always operated, in terms of how he's always operated, he he is not exactly a uh, he's not exactly a shy person. Uh, like he, there are there are a lot of instances I think like where he's openly uh, openly called for Israel to try and drone strike him as he like walked freely in the streets. But this is before October seven. I'm I'm talking about. So um, it, it's not like he was. Um, he, he wasn't similar to the usual Politburo chiefs and the way that they are uh, and the way that they are presented to mainstream media, like other uh, Palestinian leadership that was oftentimes maybe even seen at odds with the immediate interests of of uh, Palestinians, that they are like wealthy. They live in Doha. They're 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 not they're far removed from the consequences of of um like Israel's violent actions, even though they are making these decisions, right? Um, he, on the other hand, was always uh, amongst the, the population. Uh, I will, of course, bring up uh, Hind Hassan's interview with him, which I have literally watched before. Hind Hassan says, This was my interview with Lama al Arian, documentary filmmaker, war reporter, Vice News, and NPR. It's his last ever on-camera interview. Everyone told us he was hiding as it was just days after an assassination attempt during 11 days of Israeli bombardment in 2021. We found him walking down the street, so we stopped him and asked for an interview. We found him walking in Jabalia. After we introduced ourselves and asked for an interview, he said he would consider it and that he would be in touch. Later, Hamas contact got in touch with the team and arranged a time and location. The interview was for Vice News. So... Um, he was not the leader of the al Qassam Brigades, for your information. That is Mohammed Daif. He was the political leader who wanted to be more involved militarily. Sorry. It is interesting, though, once again, um, we'll dive further into the background and into the mentality of, of Yahya Sinwar. I've read primarily Israeli, uh, Israeli reporting on him. Like, that's the most access that I have. Because uh, he wrote a book. Uh, he wrote a book. He spent most of his... He spent a big chunk of his life, two decades in Israeli prison. Um, his, uh, primary his primary responsibility for Hamas was uh, to seek out collaborators. So like most of the people that he actually punished or killed were Palestinian before, um, uh, before he went to Israeli prison. And um, so in, in Israeli prison, he basically learned a lot about Israel. One thing that you hear about him, one thing... One thing that you hear about him quite a lot from at least like uh, uh, Israeli people that are knowledgeable on these matters is that uh, one thing that I've heard so consistently, both from David Remnick and many other people in Israel, is that they always say Yahya Sinwar understood us, as in Israeli society, better than we could ever understand Palestinians. Like that is... And these are not people who like him, okay? These are not, like, people who are pro Yahya They're saying that as someone who learned uh, Hebrew in Israeli prison, as someone who translated many Hebrew works into Arabic, and even wrote his own book uh, as well, uh, like, they, it, 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 someone who was friends with an uh, Israeli dentist uh, during his time in Israeli prison, like, there are a lot of people. He was a... He was more accessible uh, to the, the average Palestinian than, than many other uh, people in, in uh, the Hamas leadership structure. And uh, he was also more accessible to even Israeli people as well. 
Born in southern Khan Yunus to Palestinian refugee parents, he was 25 at the time of the first Intifada, or uprising, in 1987. Yeah, he was born in 1962 to a refugee camp, by the way, a refugee camp that still very much exists, by the way, even though Israel basically destroyed it. So, like, uh, that gives you a little bit of a better understanding of, like, the terms and conditions into to what, uh, d what Yahya, the world that Yahya Sinwar came into. Recruited to the newly formed Hamas, quickly becoming its chief enforcer, punishing, killing Palestinians suspected of collaborating with Israel. In 1989, he was yeah. convicted by Israel for the abduction and killing of two Israeli soldiers and the murder of four Palestinians. He spent 22 years as an Israeli prisoner, even giving interviews in fluent Hebrew. Studying Israeli society, media, politics, the better he had it to attack and undermine them. His then interrogator telling us today that he was never in doubt about the threat he posed. I'm really glad that he was, he's dead. <laughs> yeah, his interrogator thought he was a highly dangerous person when he was in prison. He tells interrogators he's going to remember all their faces. He also learned Hebrew while in prison, yes. Because it's very important, and believe me, I know him, to the whole world. Not only to the Israel state, to the whole world. Because his dream was to kill Israeli Jews and infidels. That was his big dream. I think that's a bastardization. Like, I don't, I don't think that that second part is correct. In 2011, he was one of more than a thousand Palestinian prisoners released in exchange for the captured Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit, doctrinaire. It's interesting because he, so while he was in Israeli prison, he was scheming, right? While he was in Israeli prison, he was scheming to, to figure out a way to do like a hostage negotiation already. Um, like to, to potentially like do a prison break, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And he was one of the primary parties in the negotiations process. Um, he was a, a, a primary, he was a principal negotiator. Like he played a role in this uh, hostage swap that occurred with Gilad Shalid. Long opposed to the Oslo peace process with the aim of eradicating Israel and reclaiming all of Palestine, he established himself as a chief strategist, boosting ties with Iran. In 2015, he was defined by the U.S. government as a specially designated global terrorist. His seniority within Hamas was cemented in 2017 when he became its Gaza chief, changing the power balance in favor of its military wing. The same year, Hamas issued an updated charter suggesting it would accept an interim Palestinian state alongside Israel. Sinwar entering into what some saw as an unspoken arrangement with Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel allowing Qatari funding for Gaza in the hope of containing Hamas and maintaining the division between it and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. But as October the 7th proved, and his speech nearly a year before it suggested, Sinwar was still planning a major attack. We will come to you, God willing, in a roaring flood. We will come to you with an endless number of rockets. We will with an end Wait, where did it, when did he say this? 2017? We will come to you with an endless number of rockets. We will come to you in a flood of soldiers without limit. We will come to you with millions of our nation, tide after tide. With the Al-Aqsa flood, as he called last year's attack, killing 1,200 Israelis and capturing 200... Oh, 2022. It was two years ago. Okay. Sinwar dealt Israel a military a humiliation before. and a deep psychological wound. But it also brought an unprecedented Israeli response, laying waste to Gaza, killing thousands of civilians and destroying much of Hamas's military capacity and now all of its top-level leadership. This, according to the IDF, is the moment a tank fired on the building Sinwar was holed up in. Hassan, looking back now, don't you think that it was Gaza's misfortune that Sinwar got released considering the state of Gaza now under his leadership? Well, considering prior to his release that Gaza wasn't exactly looking too great, and even after his release, Gaza isn't looking too great, and that the responsible party for Gaza's demise is always going to be the occupying state, the sovereign state of Israel. Um, no, I don't think that his release, because I, I don't think that his release uh, plays a role in what Gaza looks like, considering that, you know, Israel has, has historically almost always occupied it and has controlled everyday existence in Gaza. Um, I don't, I'm not a believer that I am not a personal believer that like October 7 is when uh, this history unfolded or history happened and that the, there was nothing prior to that. 
Um, and that's precisely the reason why many people will say that you cannot kill an idea. The people will always yearn for emancipation. That's a totally normal, totally understandable, totally human position to have. And, uh, and that's precisely the reason why, for example, Hassan Nasrallah's uh, assassination by, by Israel has not changed the dynamic uh, with uh, Hezbollah still very much fighting against uh, the Israeli incursion into Lebanon because it has nothing to do with the leadership unless you personally think that like these guys have the capacity to brainwash you know millions of people and are just like mind controlling them somehow into resisting against the state of Israel and that it's not coming out of a normal very human place of wanting to not live under the ruthless cruel brutal military occupation of a settler colony historically that has dominated them, humiliated them, pushed them into a corner with no other way out. Um, that's the reason why I wanted to uh, look at uh, this, this vice coverage from 2021, which is uh, of course prescient uh, considering the, the way that once again, Gaza looks in 2021, far before October 7. And uh, this is uh, one of the last Western interviews that, that Yahya Sinwar ever gave. Uh, I've watched this video on stream before. I think I might have watched it multiple times. But having said that, I think it'll help you uh, develop a deeper understanding of the, the experiences that Palestinians go through and where it stems from. And this is the Bizlash Brigade of soldiers who killed him operating in that area on the day. Like... This, this place is nothing. Uh, th this changes like not a lot uh, in terms of uh, the, the way that Israel is behaving either. I disagree with this perspective because October 7th happened. The death toll accelerated. Saying that Sinwar's release was not unfortunate for them seems divided from the reality. Even though it's Israel's doing the atrocities of October 7th, form of resistance could have been viewed as an unfortunate miscalculation. This way out that's being played out now seems worse, especially if things go back to apartheid anyway. Um... I'm not Palestinian. I don't live in Gaza. I don't, uh, I, I can't speak on, um, I guess, like the broader analysis beyond the fact that uh, I don't feel comfortable placing the blame of a uh, violent settler colony that has killed and displaced tens of millions of, of Palestinians. I don't, I, I don't feel like it's appropriate to, to, lay, to lay the blame in the hands of, of anyone that is resisting against their own brutal occupation. Like you can't, it's like saying the Warsaw prison, uh, the Warsaw ghetto uprising is responsible for the Holocaust. That's a ridiculous argument to make. Uh, it's not a correct argument to make. It is completely, uh, it's antithetical to everything I believe. This is such a bad take. I can't. Yeah. Especially because you're, you're hyper focusing, um, chatter you're hyper focusing on a singular person and not the broader concept of of humiliating and destroying the lives of millions of people and i think that you can't have that opinion unless you legitimately think it was the singular person that like mind controlled people into acting this way you know what i mean like no i think that it is a understandable position that people will have when their lives have been ruthlessly dominated by this settler colony that's it right earlier this month i read ezra klein's interview with franklin ford the author of the recent sweeping article in the atlantic looking back at the biden administration's gaza policy in which Ford made an interesting claim about biden's red line on rafa in march okay we'll look at this later so like every every kind of conversation that we have about yahya sinwar or any kind of resistance against israel um has to be within the framework of like how we got here because Many people, I think many people personally think like, oh no, these guys are just like ruthless barbarians and they just want to kill Jews and that's why they are in this position uh, and that's why they did what they did. And that's just objectively incorrect. Um, I, I think I've done enough uh, commentary on that front. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's pretty illogical and mostly uh, Islamophobia that... that is the missing puzzle piece for you to make to this leap, especially when you think about like fundamentalists and how they came to power within uh, Palestinian governance. 
uh, those guys are seen as like the less corruptible forces, but ultimately they were the only game in town for quite a while. And that was a miscalculation, I think, from the Israeli government as well, because they definitely played a significant role both in the occupation, obviously, that created this hostility towards them. But beyond that, um, saying that, like, well, it's better if they're not the secular Western focused types, but instead the more fundamentalist types that are easily cast aside as like terrorist barbarians. We can do a very good job of, of like presenting them as an inherently hostile force that needs to be wiped out with force. So um, time and time again, Benjamin Netanyahu and many others uh, in Israeli society in positions of power have openly stated that that was the goal. So that is how you arrive at a Yahya Sinwar type of person. That is how you uh, arrive at like a more fundamentalist group of, of uh, resistance forces that are not comprised of fundamentalists themselves for the most part. But let's continue. The Tel Satan neighborhood, Rafa, southern Gaza. Israeli soldiers have stumbled on the country's most wanted man. A gunfight had ensued. A tank shelled the building. Then a drone is sent in. It picks up Sinwar sitting in an armchair still alive. Looks like a hand is missing. Eyes on the approaching machine. The last act of armchair aggression from the man who planned the death of so many. Throwing a stick at a UAV. But yeah, this completely cuts against like all of the Israeli propaganda that was conducted on this matter. Presenting Yahya Sinwar as a, like an out of touch... Um, like out of touch with the with the devastation that he was responsible for post October seven, a careless, uh, bloodthirsty monster that doesn't care about however many Palestinians die in the process, because it it directly cuts away it cuts against that when he you know died fighting all the way till his last breath. So that that is the reason why I, I didn't fully understand why they show showed this drone footage. Maybe they were like really excited. Maybe they were just like really fucking excited about the prospect of like um, showcasing uh, Yahya Sinwar as like dead. Um. The Israelis released pictures of items they say were found with the body from suitably sinister to mawkish and mundane cash, bullets, ID papers, mentos. Also a map of what's reported to be a tunnel network. Along with Sinwar's brother Mohammed, Khalil al Haya is a candidate for the next leader of Hamas. Today, thought to be in Qatar, eulogized Sinwar and ruled out an imminent release of hostages in Gaza. Those prisoners will not return to you until the aggression on our people in Gaza is stopped and full withdrawal from it and release our heroes, the prisoners, from the occupation jails. And we continue with the Hamas. Oh no, Sinwar was an everyday carry Reddit guy. Yeah, his everyday carry always featured uh mentos that is real by the way like he no i think he really liked mentos that was his like that was the thing 101 hostages are still being held in gaza at least half of them thought to be still alive their friends and family took to the streets of tel aviv again today here in israel we don't celebrate the elimination of our enemies we celebrate when our loved ones come back home hostages square we met the cousin of carmel gat the occupational therapist was one of a group of six. By the way, this video bites the entire Israeli project in, in Gaza in the ass. They can use a drone to go into a building and easily find one quote unquote terrorist. And why the fuck are they dropping 2,000 bombs all over the place? Well, the thing is, they literally lucked into finding him too. They didn't even kill him as like the high profile target. Like, I think it also further demonstrates the incompetence, even with the motherfucking American military's surveillance tools at their disposal. It was never about Hamas, and this video very inadvertently shows that Israel's admitting to this. Yeah, it's not like they droned that area. That drone, most likely, is not even fucking fashioned by the IDF. A lot of those soldiers go and buy their own personal drones. They do GoFundMes and shit because they don't want to get into, like, direct conflict. They don't want to get into direct combat, so they, like, oftentimes use drones to surveil it beforehand. Those are not, like, standard... Um, those drones are not even, like, standard operation drones. They usually literally go and get those drones on their own. Yeah. You're lying? Yes. 100%. The thing is, uh, Israel does have incredible precision striking capabilities, of course. Um, but um, overall, 
This is so skewed at a talk in my uni. They disavow beating. Thinking about the words of Che. I know you've come to kill me. Shoot, coward. You are only going to kill a man. Yeah. Six hostages murdered in Gaza's tunnels back in August. DNA found at the scene indicated that Sinwar had also been in the area, possibly using Carmel and the others as human shields. Some people... Oh my god, come on, dog. Like, bro, they killed him alone. Like, they killed him alone, and they're like, but he might have actually had hostages with him. It's like, dude, come... You can't fucking package this up as a human shield narrative when, like, the fucking drone footage contradicts that. What the fuck do you mean? That's crazy. Okay, there were no human shields. There were no human shields there, but I'm gonna imagine them being there anyway is a wild fucking assessment to make. But I think it goes, uh, it goes to show, like, the attitude that a lot of people have about this stuff. They're just like... They would rather hallucinate a different reality than the one that they are even presenting to you immediately, right? Like, that argument in and of itself is also stupid. It's like, yeah, he had a bunch of hostages with him, which is why we shot him with a tank. Because that's the level of care we have for our own hostages that we want to return. In the government in Israel wants to go on fighting forever. And to keep on fighting, even though we eliminated Sinuar, even though we have a chance to get the hostages back. We need to focus on what's important, and most of the Israelis think exactly what I what I think they think that the most important thing is the hostages and if we miss I don't, this chance this I don't fully agree with that I don't think most of the Israelis I mean a lot of Israelis do want the hostages back but I wouldn't say that most of the Israelis are not celebrating uh Yahya Sinmar's death like I don't agree with that most of Israeli society was like basically packed up when uh when when Netanyahu threw a bone to the Lebanon invasion camp like, they literally fucking stopped the hostage conversations that were getting really heated inside of Israel, if you remember. Um, like, I don't think this person is a bad person, for the record. Like, especially in comparison to, like, uh, especially in comparison to, to, you know, how some in the Israeli society view this uh, entire situation. Um, I just, I think it's a little bit naive, on the other hand. Um, especially when you see this kind of shit all the time. While celebrating the death of Yahya Zimar, Israelis at Mahana Yehuda Market in Jerusalem sing the new unofficial Israeli anthem, May Your Village Burn. <laughs> and meanwhile, it's not... For those, I guess, maybe not... He might be naive, but let me tell you something, okay? There are plenty of fucking overtly idiotic people, especially in American media, that immediately went, Oh, well, Yahya Zimar is dead. Now, I guess, like, Israel can finally do a ceasefire... And it's like, no, dog, they fucking have been bombing today. They haven't stopped bombing Gaza. So what happened? So what happened? Surely, surely they'll stop any moment now is, is, is only a position you can arrive at if you are the dumbest fucking rube of all time. Damn, this guy's good.